Hi, I'm Derek Morrison, and welcome to another episode of Bring Your Own. Today's an extra special episode for all of us at the BYO Podcast team as we celebrate one of our favorite topics, orange wine. Orange wine, macerated wine, skin contact wine, it's probably one of the most fascinating, misunderstood, and inspiring topics in all of the wine world. Joining us today with bottles from their own cellars are Doug Regg from Le Cap de Perrin, Laura Poetry, Executive Sommelier of The Social Company, and Simon Wolf, author of the new book Amber Revolution, celebrating all of the great things that we love about the world of orange wine. Special thanks to the great team at Trangallon Restaurant for hosting us. You can find them online at www.trangallon.com. If you enjoy the episode, please take a moment to give a review online and follow us on social media. You can find us online at BYO Podcast. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being with us today. A uh, real pleasure to have you for a pretty special episode with us. Uh, I'm to go around the room quickly and uh, introduce ourselves. Uh, tell us a bit about who you are, where you're from, what you do. Okay, I'm Doug Regg, and I'm um, the marketing director for Le Cave de Perenne, and I am also do a little bit of buying now for my sins. Um, we are um, a natural wine specialist, I would suppose you would call us, and we import from 21 countries in the world now, and uh, we also have some wine bars in London, and we organise the Real Wine Fair. I'm Laure Patry, so I'm the executive at Sommelier for the group uh, Social Company, and uh, so it's uh, run by British chef Jason Atherton. And then I run uh, Social Wine and Tapas, which is a little wine bar, restaurant, retail uh, in central London as a day to day. So today's theme, uh, we're celebrating something that's really near and dear to the B- BYO family's heart, uh, orange wine, um, for lack of a better term, which I hope we'll explore a bit in, in detail as, uh, uh, as we go. So, uh, Laura, you brought a, a bottle for us today. Why don't you tell us a bit about what you brought and yes. uh, get some in the glass? So I brought uh, La Bestia, which is from Oriol Artigas, is from Catalonia, is made from Panza Blanca, which is uh, Zarello. And I actually discovered it a few months ago and I tasted it a few days ago with the producer. So I thought, uh, why not to bring this wine? So it's a very uh, short skin maceration, only of one week, um, in stainless steel. And then a part of the, the juice afterwards go in an uh, oak barrel for four months, um, and then the rest uh, on the lees. So I, I just want to show maybe a orange or amber wine, which is um, a, a little bit of a lighter style. Um, sometimes it's quite interesting as an introduction, I think, to people. Uh, that it can be, you know, still very fresh, and you get, I think you get quite a lot of aromatic being very close to the to the Mediterranean. So you get really these Mediterranean herbs and a lot of that saltiness as well, uh, with a bit of texture as well from the um, from the skin. I think. Yeah, that saltiness, that kind of briny character, is just really nice textural contrast to some of the softer textures on the palate. It's really, it's really actually, fresh. It's actually eight years old vines as well. So uh, quite interesting, I think, for that uh, grape variety to have like uh, super old vines and making that style of wine. Maybe less so now, but in, in the past, um, orange wines were mistaken for being far too heavy or extracted or um, broading. And, and I think one of the things that makes them so beautiful as a pair of wine is this kind of freshness, this texture, this, this play on textures and the contrast. And, and um, I'm really glad that we started with something fresh and that you kind of touched on that. It, it, do you think that like that's changed over the years or the perceptions come differently or how, you know, I remember for when I first moved to London going to terroir, tasting some of the orange wines by the glass and discovering a lot of different things that I hadn't explored before. When those were kind of introduced to the market, do you remember the initial public response or maybe how you've seen that five years ago to compare it to now, both of you? Uh, well, me, yes, definitely. I, I, I spent a lot of time in terroir early on and I think the level of knowledge uh, University was 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 not you know terribly strong. I mean, not only about natural wines, but 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 orange wines specifically. Uh, so even the presentation of the wine, which would always come in a carafe, so people think they're ordering a white wine, they're getting something which is anything from sort of like this color here that we're enjoying to something burnt amber. Uh, so that immediately rings alarm bells. People think the wine is oxidized or caramelized or off and then they smell it and it's not the aromas are not in the normal spectrum of fresh light you know fruity smells they're they're much richer they're much more complex but they're not thinking I'm looking at effectively a red wine 
uh, and when they taste the wine, they're, they're distracted by the tannin, the temperature is all over the place. You know, for, for them, it's, you know, it would have been far too warm to serve a wine like that. But in fact, that's the perfect temperature. Gradually, people stopped questioning the wines and the way they're served and the colors and the flavors, and actually acknowledged that there's a whole spectrum of styles. It's not just this style and that style. What we'll taste tonight will show the versatility of orange wines. They're as versatile as whites or as reds. So I'd say I probably started with uh, maybe the most famous producer like Gravner and Radicon and that's kind of how I knew orange wine. And uh, basically, as you said, I mean, recently a lot of people are making orange wine, a lot of producers, and on a you know, few days to a few months, skin contact, and then, and then I went to Georgia, and then I learned, you know, how's the orange wine in Georgia. So everyone is making such a different style, which I think for me is, is super interesting. And, and I have a lot of different style on my wine list, and it depends on what People, people like. I mean, some of them can be quite intense, as you said, and some of them are very elegant, very delicate. So I do a lot by the glass. I think I do about five different skin contacts by the glass. So we do Gravner, we do Radicon, we do as well a Georgian wine, which is made from Kissy, which is a bit easier, even though it's six months in Kevri. But um, I do as well a Rena Sister by the glass, uh, which is on, it's not very long skin contact. So yeah, I think it's quite in, important for people to taste as well. and. And, uh, and see the differences because it can be so many different styles. Are people now ordering the wine more knowing what it is or are they really kind of still trend seeking in terms of looking for something orange or something macerated but the, the still kind of uh, um, new, to the, new to the spectrum? Yeah, I think I have a lot of people ordering because they know already what it is. I always ask, do you know the wine, do you know the style of the wine? And they're, they're pretty comfortable with it. So. It seems like the, the category really exploded in the last, I don't know, two years, three years yeah. maybe? It went from being a... It was very controversial mm. when, it, when it started, I mean, particularly Gravner, because he was making non-orange wines before he went, you know, had his epiphany in Georgia and went down completely the opposite track and went for a, a you know, rather than clean skin wines, something which is quite extractive and complex and, you know, needed aging. Uh, so at the time, a lot of people, especially his, his existing customers, Thought he was completely crazy, um, and then I suppose you know, then he inspired, or Radicon came along just afterwards, and Princich, and then, and then it, it seemed to be something very local to one part of um, uh, of, uh, of Italy, of Friuli mm -hmm. and Slovenia, and then it, it seemed to spread throughout Italy, but it was spreading. It was going. It was returning to to, to methods of making wine, peasant wine. Vino Janko, as they call it, uh, you know, like yellow wine, which they'd been making for hundreds of years. But we don't know what people were drinking then. But it was it was an obvious thing to do, just to chuck the grapes into a in, into a into a vessel of some sort, a pot or whatever it might be, and just ferment them on their skins. Yes. And now we're seeing a revival of that style and try to, you know, people are innovating by going back into the past and 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 trying to sort of revive their sort of flavors because they're really interesting uh, and they're very gastronomic as well, I'm sure you find. Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, especially even for Michelin star, not for just, a, you know, wine bar as we, places we go, but as well for Michelin star, you can have a small glass in the middle of a tasty menu and it's a way to introduce to, to customer and for them to understand the matching. Yeah. I think what's really exciting about wine in general right now is I feel like there's never been a time where we're more colorblind. And I don't know, is, do you, would you agree with that? Is that kind of seem in tune? It seems like it's more just a uh, one unified tapestry of wine and everything kind of fits in one axis. I agree. And I think the really healthy thing is we've got away from this, like, what is, this is white. I mean, nothing, nothing is white. The wine is not white anyway. You know, it's, it's got color. Even if you just press it, it's got some sort of color unless you keep on filtering it into extinction. So there's not white and there's not red either. There's, there's so many shades. I really like that you brought a wine from Spain as well in this style. And maybe talk a bit about you know, some of the wines you work with or, or why, why you look to Catalonia for, for this one? I mean, I work quite a bit with Spanish wine and I just think it's uh, an area where there's a lot of uh, new producers, small growers, and then making low intervention, which is more what I focus on and, and using you know, no sulfur or working on high altitude vineyard and, and you get a lot more fresher wine that maybe we used to get uh, years back. So I'm um, even from the south of Spain, so it's a, it's a very um, dynamic area and it's an interesting, I think, country at the moment to look at, yeah. Delicious, perfect, perfect wine to start on, thank you. We're now joined by Simon Wolf. Simon, really glad you could be here with us. Uh, why don't you just give a, take a moment to tell us a bit about yourself and uh, what you do and why you're here. 
Um, sure. So I write about wine um, for a living, and I've been slightly obsessed about orange wines, I guess, since I first tasted them about seven years ago, um, to the point that I went searching for a, a book. Uh, I couldn't find a book, so I ended up writing one. Fantastic. Great. Uh, so Doug, thanks for pouring the next wine um, that you've brought for us. Can you just tell us a bit about what you brought? It's a wine that, uh, from a grower, uh, when I first tasted it, and I first tasted his wines, gave me a bit of a wine epiphany. Uh, so the grower is Zalta Mlechnik and his son Clemen. Um, and um, he's really part, of, I suppose, of the, you know, the early skin contact movement. Uh, he's based in uh, Vipava, uh, very close to the border, about a kilometre or two in the border with uh, Italy, Friuli. His family, or he has been working sort of organically, but not for that long. And I think he had a bit of a, an epiphany himself uh, and started making wines in a much more sort of like, you know, natural and uh, less on the sort of aromatics and much more on the sort of intensity of texture and, and flavor. This wine called Cuvée Anna, or Anna Cuvée, dedicated to his grandmother, uh, is 2010 vintage. Um, this wine always sees a long time aging before release. Um, as Walter would say that basically he wants the wine to be walking and not just crawling when it, when it's, when it first sees the light of day. It's, a, it's what you would call a field blend. It's got some Malvasia, uh, it's got some Chardonnay, it's got some Sauvignas, which is also known as Friulano, and it's got the great Rabula in it as well, or Ribola Jana as it's called on the other side. Um, it sees comparatively little skin contact, uh, doesn't like using more than sort of three to five days maximum, which is surprising considering the colour. Uh, it does spend the best part of two years, maybe a bit touch more in, in barrel, 500 litres to 3,000 litres, and then the same amount or even more time in bottle, and then it's released usually after sort of five, six years. And at that point, it's pretty harmonious, but still, there's noticeable tannin, there's lots of structure, and I like the interplay of the different grape varieties. You know, Ribula is sort of like, gives up the sort of lovely, sort of bitter, bitter sort of fruits, and then you've got like freshness from the Sauvignas, um, sort of certain sort of aromatic quality, but they all sort of weave in and out. And as the wine opens up, I love graphing this and just drinking it over one day, two days, even three days, it holds its own beautifully and sometimes it closes down and sometimes it opens up to, which to me is one of the great attractions of orange wines or skin contact wines is they is they just move in so many different ways this wine to me is, is something really quite magnificent quite beautiful well um, i have to thank you for bringing this dog because i think this this wine and this vintage is really one of my desert island wines i could happily drink this <laughs> for many years to come because it's it's i think it's it's got, it's got harmony, it's got elegance. That's, uh, that's what I really enjoy about this wine. It's got this really kind of soft, elegant power. I mean, this really deep intensity that's just really understated, if that makes any sense. It's got this wonderful tens tension on the mid-palate, but then as it finishes, it gets this kind of retro-nasal, licorice kind of character that just contrasts so nicely with like kind of the purity of it. It's really... It's a really cohesive, really beautiful but one. The, the infusion, I mean, the, the idea that, you know, it's 12% alcohol, you know, but people, when they look at it, wine in the glass, they think that's going to be a really powerful wine. Yeah. But its yeah. power is its refinement, is its elegance, is its understatement. And that's, to me, a real power. It's a sort of confidence, uh, rather than just sort of trying to sort of bang you over the head and say, look how much is going on in the wine. It has that sort of in, mm. inherent structure, which, which, um, which is really, really becoming. I think what I, um, what I find interesting about this as well is I think the, the Ribolla is only 10% in the blend, but you can still feel the power of it. You, know, you yes. can still feel the, the grunt and the structure. Yeah, I think Ribolla is, is one, of the, one of the great grapes. And, and sort of, I think it's become a noble grape now, would you say? Uh, it's certainly highly regarded. Yeah. You wouldn't say it was a noble grape if you didn't macerate it, really, would you? Yes. I mean, no. it, you, have, you, have to, you have to macerate it to, to unlock all that power. I, I always think it's rather dull if you just make it as a, as a standard white wine or a sparkling wine like so many people on the other side of the border do. I thought it was going to be quite big actually when I taste it, like you said. It's a lot of truffle and a nice, much more floral. Yeah. I was speaking with Volta and Clement um, earlier this year and they were saying basically their idea with this wine is to go back to how 
the wines in Vipava would have been made 150 years ago. So we, we have this wonderful book called Wine Making for Slovenians, published in 1844 by a priest. And basically, he sets out a perfect method for making wine and for um, looking after your vineyards. And that's what the Melechniks have gradually gone back to bit by bit. And so he always says that in the Vipava Valley, this beautiful valley where this, this wine is from, it's four to five days is the, is the tradition there. Um, if you go a little bit further northwest, then that's where they really go for the, you know, a month or more of, of maceration. But I, I think in this valley, this is, this is the tradition and that's what they're, they're trying to express. And this is the blend as well. So every single aspect is really yeah. rooted in tradition. It's got everything that I would look for in a great orange wine. It's got the acidity, it's got texture. There's still a suggestion of fruit. You know, it's all, it's all there. So Doug, as a, as a BYO veteran regular, we, we, we felt it was only appropriate for such a topic that we let you bring a, something extra. So why don't you tell us a bit about this wine that you brought, that you just poured for us as well. So I'm going back to the dawn of civilization, wine civilization rather. <laughs> Our good friend, uh, Iago Vitorishvili. So we're in Georgia here, and Georgia, the self-styled cradle of wine. Um, they've been making wine for probably around 8,000 years. Iago is in... Um, a little village called Chardaki, which is in Kartli, um, and that's slightly in the eastern part of Georgia. And the grape variety, the main grape variety in this region is called Chinori, which is a sort of like quite light-skinned and uh, quite a late ripening grape variety. It's just a touch cooler around mm. where, where we are here. What I love about the grape variety is it's, it's acidity, you know, it, you know they, they, they harvest it really quite late, and, and yet the acidity is really high. Um, Iago himself does six months skin maceration uh, with full stems and, and pips and the whole lot. Everything goes in. So they, what they do is they crush it and then they add the, the cha-cha, which is the, the mark or the pomace. You know, they add it back into the cavevri. It ferments in its own time, naturally. Um, the cavevri are buried in the winery. Uh, and then it's transferred to a clean pot and, and then it ages usually eight to ten months, uh, and then it's bottled without any additions. This is, to me, a great skin contact wine for Georgian beginners because of its freshness, its exuberance, its purity and its naturalness. And here, Iago is a sort of like a very generous person and very smiley and always like, you know, very happy. And his wines are like effervescent, alive, you know, and six months skin contact could give something which is very heavy and very just like a bit you know, flat and bland, but this isn't. It's, it's just skittering along my palate. And uh, it's the 2017 vintage, which is, I think people actually made quite decent wine despite the fact it was an incredibly hot year. When I first got exposed to Georgian Quevery wines, I tasted a lot of these massive tannic monsters. And I thought they were, they were kind of cool, but I was a bit scared of them. <laughs> um, and, but then I just, I kind of made my peace with them and I thought, okay, that's what Georgian Quevery wines are supposed to be like. And then, until I tasted this. And then that's, that's when it hit me that if you're really in charge of what's going on in your vineyards um, and your fruit is really top quality and your yields are kept low, then you can achieve something quite different. Yeah. It's, it's amazing just the brightness of fruit on this wine. I mean, it's just so exuberant, which is, you feel some of that that structure, you feel some of that tannin, obviously, like you feel those, those elements, but I mean, when I think of this wine and the finish on it, it's just ping. I mean, it just really has this brightness about it that's just really um, energizing. And the, I think the local grape variety is super interesting because it's grape variety you never have anywhere else in most of Georgia, so it's, it's really nice to try something really different that you never try anywhere else. I brought the, the Airday 2015 from, from Sepp Musser from, from Styria in Austria. And um, I discovered this wine a few years ago when I was in Vienna at a buffet. And uh, 
I, the first thing that struck me was the bottle, just it was sitting on the bar as part of the taste menu. So I don't know what that is, but it's really interesting and it's got a beautiful um, artistic label. And I said, I just, I just want to try it. I mean, pure, pure judging a book by its cover, I was just a little bit of curiosity. And it was just a really kind of profound, interesting, challenging wine. And then as I got to um, know the wines from Mooster more, I just fell in love with the domain and, and um, all the estate's wines. And the, the, uh, the Graffine is one of my personal favorites as well. And I just, I just think it's such a fascinating wine that, I've, that it, I had just such an ignorant discovery of. And I just felt so lucky to have stumbled across it that night. And, and, um, and so I always, it always attracts my gaze ever since. So it felt like kind of a, a fun fitting bottle. And, and, and maybe Doug is uh, the, the, my dealer of, uh, uh, provider of this wine. Uh, maybe you can tell us a bit more of, uh, um, about it. Seth and Maria Muster, they're in South Styria, very close to the border of, of Slovenia. And um, it's got around sort of oh, 10, 15 hectares. Um, planted to uh, different varieties, Sauvignon um, and Chardonnay. And this is a blend of Sauvignon and Chardonnay. And Seth's part of a, a little group called Schmeck des Leben, Taste of Life, of um, you know, five really interesting biodynamic growers who are making natural wines and they exchange ideas about winemaking and farming. The vines are beautiful. I mean, it's a gorgeous place, you know, surrounded, very hilly, surrounded by forests and the quality of the grapes is, is paramount, of course, when you're making any sort of natural wines and not using sulfur, which he isn't now. He makes a couple of um, skin contact wines. One's called Greffin, which is Sauvignon, uh, and then he makes a counterpart called Graf. Greffin is Countess, Graf is Count. And um, so one has skin contact, the Greffin, and the other one doesn't. And then um, there's the Erda, which is 12 months on skins. This is from the 2015 vintage, which was um, in an area which is quite difficult to make wine, quite marginal, um, was probably <laughs> the last, you know, reasonably large vintage uh, they had, although 17 was, was, was fair enough. He, he said like for every year in the barrel there should be a year in the bottle before it's released. So normally he would like to age it two years in barrel and two years in bottle. He doesn't have the luxury, they don't, they don't make enough wine. The labels I think they're indicative of the wine, you know, so it's a bit like Rothko-esque if you look at it, Erda means earth, there's the, there's the sun, you know, the sun, the light, the green, which is the, which is the, which is the grass, the grass, and then the earth, which in the balance, this is the earth wine, so there's much more brown. So think of, think of the vines penetrating this, this incredible opoc soil, which is the name of the local soil, which is this marly soil, and it has a profound effect on the wine, it gives them, gives them intensity and a richness, which we see in all the wines of Styria. They've got this huge mouthfeel, and yet they're not heavy. I mean, I, I get kind of time to segue into a bit of your book, I suppose, um, aptly titled The Amber Revolution. Um, you know, we've kind of taken a bit of a <laughs> perfect. We've taken a bit of a journey kind of across, uh, across, uh, across Europe, really, and, and then into, into Georgia. Can you just tell us a bit, about, as you've kind of gone across the different regions, what, some of the things that surprised you or any, anything that stuck, sticks out from respective regions? And we've tasted you know, Austria, Georgia, uh, Catalonia. I think the, the interesting thing is that, first of all, if you, if you go back a few hundred years in Europe, all white grapes were uh, fermented with skin contact. There, there was no other way to make wine, really. Um, and I think at a certain point my research uh, became a bit circular because I just kept on coming up, up against the same thing. Well, of course, that's always how we used to make wine. The problem is it's, it's not documented very well. So there are really only two parts of the world where I can prove it. And one is Georgia, where we have this, this wonderful archaeological find going back 8,000 years. And the other place where we can say 100% is that kind of middle... Euro, uh, Europe kind of part with bits of Slovenia and bits of Friuli and bits of Austria and there there are, there are there's plenty of books uh, written where people say oh the people make their white wines like their red wines in these in these strange regions so I think there there is history when you look for it in every corner that points to the importance of this style I do want to say something about this wine as well because I think what's interesting to me is uh, Southern Styria is famous for its Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, although nowadays most of the Sauvignon Blanc is made in a, a rather mainstream commercial style. But 
what I find interesting in Sepp's wines and his colleagues as well is that they all have Sauvignon Blanc in their vineyards and they all macerate it. And for me, it still it speaks of Sauvignon Blanc utterly, but in a different way. Um, it, for me, it's, it's almost as if the, the fresh aromatics that you get in a Sauvignon without the skins mutate into more pungent, more herbal flavours. But for me, they're utterly characteristic and, and I think you know, the, the character of these wines is, is unmistakable once you've, once you've had them. And that, that, for me, is one of the big takeaways with macerating white grapes. I mean, nobody says that, nobody says when you macerate red grapes that you, that you lose varietal right. character. Yeah. Uh, so why, sh why should they say that about these wines, really? Definitely. Laura, you, you work quite a bit with some of the wines from Austria, I believe, right? Yeah, I love, I love wine from Austria. I mean, I think last year I went there three, four times, maybe, in my own, in my own time, obviously. but. Uh, yeah, I think there's a, again a revolution of a, you know natural producer there, especially Burgenland area. And then I went to Styria, and then now when I when I drink a bottle from Styria, I just think of you know the uh, the forest and the quite high altitude, and I always get that lemon thyme and you know a lot of aromatic, which I mostly got in those wines. Even though they're skin contact or not skin contact, they always have a lot of aromatic to me. Uh, I love this wine. I list it. Uh, I list a lot of their wines. And uh, yeah, it's a very exciting area. I have a full page of wine from Austria. I think it's, uh, it's an ex exciting region. I think the, the price are very good as well uh, for, you know, for natural wine, for wine of low intervention, for wine producers that are risking, you know, sometimes an entire, you know, vintage of, of making wine with, no, uh, with nothing added. So uh, yeah, a lot of hard work, and, uh, but I think the wine are really show very well. So Simon, we were really excited to have you here today to talk about your book and to celebrate you know, um, our, our mutual passion for um, the Amber Revolution, as you've aptly titled it. And um, so why don't you tell us a bit about the wine you brought that you've put in our glasses and then uh, also tell us a bit about the book. Let me talk briefly about the book first because, uh, and then that links to the wine a little bit, but I mean, very simply, the book, it was a response to the fact that there was no book. So seven years ago, I tasted a wine from a wonderful winemaker called Sandy Skirk in Friuli and it blew my mind and I wanted to understand it. I wanted to understand what, what on earth is this? Why is it this colour? Why does it taste different? Why does it smell different? And I couldn't really get enough answers. I found some articles on the internet um, and I thought there must be a book and I looked on Amazon and all those other places and I couldn't find one. Uh, and it took me a few years and eventually I got to the point of realising, OK, well, if no one else is going to write this book, then obviously yeah, I have to. What really excited me about these wines was not just how they taste and smell, but also the history and culture behind them. But the great thing was, when I wrote the book, I, I felt, OK, I also need to recommend some producers in this book. And that kind of rapidly ballooned into 180 producers, because I soon discovered that People are making amazing wines in this style on almost every corner of the planet. In fact, I've, I've just been to Japan and I discovered that there are the most beautiful, elegant orange wines being made in Japan, which I had no idea. Uh, so sadly, that's going to have to be for the, the second edition. Right. But so I was thinking about a wine to bring for this session, which was quite difficult. And I thought, well, it would be nice to bring something from the new world, just to make the point that although this is maybe a, an old world tradition, like all wine traditions, um, the new world has very much taken ownership of it. This is a wine from the Cape, from South Africa. It's made by a guy called Craig Hawkins. Tester Longer is his, his project. Craig is unique. I mean, Craig pretty much introduced the idea of skin maceration in white wine to South Africa when he started doing it in 2008 or thereabouts. So he, he used to work for a winery called Lammas Hook, um, which is still going, although without him at the helm. Um, and Tessa Longa was kind of his private project on the side in 2010 when he made this wine. And this is, uh, Craig actually told me, this is, this is the most extreme wine that he's ever made. So this was two years on its skins. And for people who don't know Craig's wines, that's a statement in itself. Normally these days he's making 
three or four orange wines every year um, with yeah, a few weeks maceration, some a bit less, some a bit more. Um, but with this, he decided to just push it as far as he possibly could. Um, what he had at his disposal in this year uh, was some, some oak barrels um, and he just uh, he actually took the tops off the barrels and put the grapes in and then put the tops back on and left it there for two years, more or less. Um, and I suspect that it was close to undrinkable a year or two after the vintage. Um, <laughs> if there's one thing that Craig loves, it's acidity. Um, he's obsessed about it. So, and for me, his wines, when they're young, they're, they're often ferociously lean and acidic. Um, but then when they age, they, they become absolutely beautiful. So this is 100% Chenin Blanc, two years on the skins, in oak. Um, which he said he probably wouldn't repeat. He quite likes the idea of trying to do this style again, but if he did it now, he would do it in concrete, um, which is probably a bit more sympathetic. Uh, the other fun story is that in 2010, somehow he managed to get an export license for this wine. A year later, in 2011, um, the 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 wine classification board in, in the Cape were fed up with him and they started refusing to give his wines a license. So he rapidly got into the situation with this style of wine where he actually, he had orders, he'd already sold the wine overseas and the wines were being denied their passport uh, to leave the country because the, the, the authorities deemed them not, not representative, not fit for, for purpose. He was victorious in the end so after his wines started getting refused their, their classification, their passport to leave the country, he and a group of his colleagues in, in the Svartland um, basically clubbed together and petitioned the, the authorities. And they managed to get uh, a new classification introduced for orange wines. I think technically they're called skin contact white wines in the legislation. And that was 2015, so that, I think, was the world's first official classification for orange wines. So it was actually quite historic. I was the one who wrote, who wrote the letters of commendation about the wines, saying that we, because we were the largest, his export market effectively, we were the only people, the first people to take the wines. So we, we said, the wines are incredibly popular. Uh, people love them, the journalists love them, even if that was not true. And so he would present the letter and as a recommendation and they would go back and test the wines and then it was okay. But the, the board seemed to alternate between the skin contact wine, which they didn't like, but actually sometimes the skin contact wine went through, but not that one, and sometimes the, the unfiltered, straight pressed, clean Shannon was the one which was like held back. So it sort of alternated, so I kept the letter, because why wouldn't you keep a letter and, and recycle it? Recycling is good. And I just basically just substituted the name of the wine that was being refused <laughs> each, each year. And then I found it wasn't just Craig, but it was pretty well anybody who made any unfiltered wine or off, off ball wine. And Craig finally, as Simon said, he said, I've had enough. Uh, there are so many people being refused wines, not just me, that I'm gonna like, create this classification. Uh, so the people at least understand uh, that the wines exist and they're intended. But one of the reasons why he's always refused, uh, refused classification is, is, is the board would say the wines are not typical of the terroir of South Africa. But when you think of the cheap and nasty things that get through, which are nothing to do with terroir, they're industrial wines, then to sort of, you know, Craig who's working organically by hand with little bush vines, 40, 50 years old, on wonderful granitic soils in the Swartland, and then you know, you know, getting something out of the grapes. Um, the acidity thing is another interesting thing. And Greg picks by, by taste, and he pops the grape in his mouth. He says, I like it, and everyone faints because they said, no, you can't pick it now because it's way too acidic. And he said, no, I love acidity. It sort of ricochets them out. And his early wines had this sort of like, I wouldn't call them green, but I would call them sort of tense to the point of like making your eyes slightly water. Um, but I love that in wines. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pro-acid in, in wines, but, but uh, some wine writers, uh, when, I, when I, uh, I point at tastings and I said like, this wine is 12% is, uh, or 11% or something like that uh, from the Swartland, you know, incredibly warm place. 
they said, it's wrong. Wine should never be that light. You know, from the Swart land, they should all be 13, 14%. And I said, not if you farm well, you know, not if you're picking on, on the moment, which of course you're picking on, not on sugar levels. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't understand acidity, the acidity Craig was getting in the wines, but then Shannon from the Loire can have amazing acidity and like, it can be fierce as well. Mm -hmm. And with time, it can soften. Unlike tannin, which can sort of not correspond to the fruit, acidity is, is, is the backbone of a wine and gives it tremendous mm -hmm. ageability. So even a wine, you know, this is 2010, I said, when we bought the 2012, which was not released because Craig didn't think anyone would allow it to get out of South Africa, but we, we took it, you know, and we just sat on it. And the wines are spectacular, but they're probably still 10 to 15 years left in them. Since 2015, 14 or 15, Craig's wines have, have totally changed. I think he's like, he's more mellow as a person. He's not sort of like, he's try, not trying to push the envelope every vintage. The skin contact wines are more 10, 12, maximum 15 days. He, he's working on one project, he's a lot more focused. And I think he's more like, he's happier in life because he's not, he's working for himself. And I think that also shows in, in the relaxation of the wines. But I remember the very first time, final little story, I met him at Terroir. Uh, he was a guy who was making 600 bottles under the Testa Long El Bandito label. So he showed me his 2008, his first vintage. And he was like, almost shaking. I mean, he's very, very nervous. And if you know him now, he's very confident and you know, self-assured, but on the cocky way, he just is what he is. And um, we taste the wine and, you know, it's really weird. Like, because there, there weren't that many intense skin contact wines around in, 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 at that time. I and mean, we didn't have that many on our list, even at Terroir. And I, I thought, there's so much potential here. I'm not sure this is the final thing that he's going to be doing, but Let's encourage him. And so we just opened lots of bottles of natural wines and I could see him thinking, 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 tasting and thinking, I want to make that, I want to make that, I want to make that. And in the end, his skin contact wines became, I think, the product of everything he tasted, but also everything he really liked to drink. So he sort of mellowed out his, his palate and it was reflected in the way that he makes wines. But this was the point where I thought, ah, like, let's just try, what would happen if, and that's, this is the result of what would happen if. And thank goodness people do push the envelope because it's really exciting when they do. Thanks everyone, I really appreciate you, you all bringing the wines you brought tonight. I think it was, it's great to just see the whole, not the whole, but a, a great representation of the spectrum of the diversity of uh, um, amber wines, orange wines, macerated uh, white wines, however we want to characterize them. I think it's, uh, it's great to show the diversity and to, to see all the different things we've signed from different parts of the world. And uh, thanks Simon for coming, join us from afar and, and, and thanks to you, to you all for joining us and uh, special thanks to the team uh, here at Trangallen for, for hosting us in their, in, in their dining room and uh, cheers. cheers. Thanks again from all of us at the BYO podcast team. We hope you enjoyed this special episode. And don't forget to grab a copy of Simon Wolf's new book, The Amber Revolution, celebrating all of the great things we love about orange wine.